Okay, so uh, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Delroy Cameron and uh, today I'll be talking about a context-driven subgraph model for literature-based discovery. I would like to uh, acknowledge and thank those people joining us remotely by GoToMeeting and we do have several folks joining us as well uh, live on Ustream. We thank you for your interest and for your attendance. So today, like I said, I'll talk about the context driven. Could you be a little closer to the mic? Here. Sure. So, uh, sure. I lost it. A little closer. Right. So uh, today we'll talk about the context driven subgraph model for literature based discovery. And just to put into perspective uh, what this talk is, will be all about, uh, in 1866, Austrian scientist Gregor Johann Mendel had explored the research question of the inheritance of traits in peas. He conducted over 10,000 experiments from which he observed that the inheritance of traits seemed to extend beyond the immediate parents uh, at several generations in the lineage. He was able to explain that the inheritance of traits uh, was as a result of random selection of what he called dominant and recessive factors. When two recessive factors randomly recombine, then we observe features in the, in the generation, in the lineage, that were not present uh, for some time. He went on to put forth what is now known as the Mendelian Laws of Inheritance as a theory uh, that essentially states that inheritance of traits and plants is governed by this random selection of these dominant and recessive factors. In 1903, American scientist Walter Sutton conducted experiments in which he explored the research question of the mechanism of, uh, of cell division in living organisms. And he conducted experiments with the embryos of grasshoppers, and he found uh, from his observations that, in fact, it was chromosomes that occur in pairs that split and then randomly recombine. Uh, uh, German scientist Theodore Boveri uh, made similar observations uh, working with the embryos uh, of uh, sea urchins and, and roundworms. Together they put forth what is now known as the very sudden chromosome theory, which in fact states that it is chromosomes that are the basis of genetic inheritance. Sutton and Boveri were able to, to link the observations in plants to that in living organisms, thereby ex uh, explaining the mechanism of interaction for uh, the inheritance of traits. These two scenarios, and se among several others, they capture some general aspects of what we know to be the science of making discoveries. Typically, there is a human who has a research question. The human will conduct experiments. These experiments will yield observations. From the observations, the human will then uh, derive explanations. If the explanation is consistent across a sufficient number of cases, then the human will put forth a theory. In today's technological world, with much of our data in digital format, uh, with information processing systems being developed to facilitate processes such as literature-based discovery, it's important to understand the role of these information processing systems in this general framework of the science of making discoveries. I share the view put forward by Don Swanson that it, the purpose of an information processing system is not to take a series of observations, process these observations, attempt to arrive at an explanation or a theory, but rather the purpose of the information processing system is to process a series of observations, find promising links, and present those to humans, who will ultimately then be able to reason on the data to try to arrive at an explanation or a theory, as the case may be. I believe this is true because humans are better able to process uh, and appreciate context uh, more than machines. For example, in the case of Mendel and Sutton, it took the human acumen, the insights of, of Sutton, to really be able to link his observations in, in the cells of living organisms to plants, experiments conducted some 40 years before. And so ultimately, it is humans who will make the discoveries, not so much the computational system. The obvious question then is how do we develop a computational system that will take these observations and provide these promising links? What are these promising links? The purpose of this PhD dissertation is to present a system, an information processing system, that takes a series of observations, processes these observations, arrives at promising links, and presents those to humans to facilitate the process of making discoveries. Uh, the, and this is consistent with my thesis statement, which says that an information processing system that leverages 
rich representations, which we will show, uh, of textual content from scientific literature based on implicit and explicit context that we will discuss can, in fact, be more be effective, uh, an effective means of facilitating lineage-based discovery. The motivation for this research, it is not inconsequential. Many of you will remember that in 1999, the pharmaceutical company Merck had launched the anti-inflammatory uh, drug called Biox, the brand name for Refecosib, to treat arthritis. Biox was highly touted. It was said to be uh, much more effective, a stronger pain medication than uh, naproxen at the time that was, uh, the brand name for that was Aleve. And uh, Biox was also deemed to have less severe side effects. Unfortunately, what Mark did not realize, and this information started becoming public in 2002, is that Biox caused an increased risk of heart attacks. Uh, in 2004, they did a, a clinical trial that confirmed uh, this to be true, although they, they attempted to sidestep the issue by claiming that the, their faulty results could be blamed on the control. Uh, a, a subsequent publication proved or showed that this was not true, which we'll talk about. Several bad things happened as a result of this. One, Vioxx was voluntarily removed from the market by Mark themselves. They were subsequently sued in 2005 and settled a lawsuit for $254 million. They also, set, by 2007, were sued by up to 50,000 people, and they agreed to pay up to $4.85 billion in, in settlements. In 2011, they paid another settlement for $950 million, and just last year, they settled for $23 million. This entire scenario could have been avoided, as is shown by an article published in the Lancet Journal in December of 2009. The authors uh, simply read, the, they studied the, the risk of cardiovascular uh, events and refocusing, and they did this by simply reading the bibliographic literature. They read articles uh, from the bibliographic databases and some files from the US FDA. And their experiments showed that by the end of the year 2000, there was certainly no evidence to suggest that the faulty results could be attributed to the control. And so this is a classic case of what we know to be literature-based discovery. Literature-based discovery, it refers to the use of papers and other academic publications to find new relationships between existing knowledge. And that's the focus of this dissertation. It is a field that was founded by Don Swanson in 1986. Uh, Swanson, in much the same way like the folks did in the Lancet Journal, he had read the titles of over 4,000 articles on Raynon and fish oil. And by looking at intersecting terms in the titles, he was able to find three unknown connections between Raynon and fish oil, which uh, have now been published and is a staple part of that research. Swanson formalized his observations as what we now know as the ABC model for literature-based discovery. Essentially what he says is, if we are attempting to make a discovery between two things, we are trying to find new knowledge, if we can develop a system that will find unknown B terms between A and C, then these B terms are candidates for discoveries. The research in this area has progressed uh, towards richer representations beyond just ABC. Early research used keyword-based, concept-based, uh, relations-based, and ultimately graph-based approaches uh, and some hybrids. Of significance among these is the approach by Dmitry Rostovsky in 2006, published in AMIA, in which he introduced this idea of discovery patterns. Essentially, using structured background knowledge, what Dmitry says is, if I know that one class of things participates in some specific relationship uh, that affects another class of things, and there's another relationship that's opposing the previous relationship, then I may be able to say that A maybe treats C, that sort of thing. The issue here is, of course, that there can be longer associations between A and B, which was noted by Bart Wolkowski and AMIA in 2011. We had a paper last year in JBI that also illustrated the same thing for recovery rate on fish oil. What our JBI paper also showed, however, is that not only do we have these A and C, or ANTS connections, paths, essentially, between concepts, but in terms of elucidating and really understanding the, the deeper meaning uh, of how things are connected, one might be able to create subgraphs where several of these paths come together based on <coughs> context. And this is the basis for the context-driven subgraph model, uh, which is the first contribution of this PhD dissertation research. So just to give some more specifics before we move forward into details, our JBI paper was, was of some significance because what we showed when we moved to the subgraph model, uh, and here is the <coughs> intermediate platelet aggregation that Swanson found, 
not only could we recover the primary association that uh, dietary fish oil disrupts platelet aggregation, which causes Raynaud, but we also saw that these fish oils, uh, salmon, mackerel, and so forth, they stimulate or they produce these prostacyclins, or epiprostanol, and it is the epiprostanols that actually treat uh, the disease. In the process, the epiprostanol, uh, the, the prostacyclins, they disrupt platelet aggregation as the mechanism for, for doing this. We did this by putting together manually these subgraphs after we extracted out uh, using uh, the tool for triple extraction from NIH SEMREP developed by Tom Reinflesch. After we extracted out those triples, we manually put together the subgraphs, and this is what we were able to see. This was important work because we had been unaware of, of any other technique that went into this level of depth and detail in terms of rediscovering and decomposing Swanson's association. We subsequently learned that one of our Noesis alumni, Dr. Kartik Krishnan, had in fact done this, albeit automatically. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan's work uh, is on published research, and so it's not visible to the scientific community. And so we are unable to do a thorough comparison with that work. In any event, the, the finding these complex associations is only one aspect of our research. What we found is that not only are there, as the, are there these complex associations between uh, Raynaud and, and fish oil and so forth in terms of platelet aggregation on the dimension of cellular activity, but there are others on the dimension of blood physiology, with uh, blood viscosity and liquids and so forth, uh, with vasoconstriction in terms of tissue function. And so the question for us, fundamental question that we address in this dissertation is not only how do we create these complex subgraphs, but how do we capture context so that we can create these subgraphs on multiple thematic dimensions? So, how do we automate this? So it is a question. Um, you have this tool of view. Uh, could, we, uh, could you... Um, uh, choose your context uh, ahead of the time uh, to find the, you know, think of it as you have these three views of interrelationship between dietary fish oil and fish oil and uh, disease. So, could you uh, choose the context uh, independently and study uh, the relationship across each of these contexts separately? Uh, we don't provide functionality for that in the tool. Uh, Dr. Shet's question is, uh, in, in the tool obvious that we have developed, do we provide the functionality to allow users to choose the context so that they can choose, uh, essentially, how they view these complex associations. No, we don't provide any features to do that. We automatically generate the subgraphs and let the data essentially give us the various contexts. Now, that would be a, a good enhancement for, for future use. So who would figure out that these are the three contexts? Is it uh, apparent, or is it just uh, through a lot of looking at the results that you can figure out there are three different contexts in which there are relationships? One way to do that would be to actually label the subgraphs, just to, to lead the user. Uh, but then, ultimately, like I said, it, it's the human that would need to go and take a look and determine what the context so is. The, 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 the thought is the following. If you look at Go ontology, there are three uh, you know, key uh, you know, uh, parts of the Go ontology, right? Cellular functions and uh, biological processes and so on. Sure. So you know that there are three you know, important uh, things, as an example. So one approach could be simply to focus on each of those uh, things. In your case, uh, maybe uh, if you're talking about disease, then there are, you know, these three things are uh, routine, I, I suppose. Well, right. Uh, I believe that if we provide uh, functionality for, for users to, to filter the, the paths that get included in the subgraphs uh, during the subgraph creation process, that would only be a way to refine and you know, allow the user to drill down. We just haven't provided that kind of functionality at, at this point. Uh, but it would be an enhancement for, for the future. It's the kind of thing to look at in the future. Uh, hey, I have one more question, sure. so I'll just go back to the previous one. Sure. So, so is platelet aggregation responsible for uh, increase in blood viscosity? Oh, no. no we, we don't know that to be the case. Um, as far as I know, no. These are, uh, no, as far as I So, so, so these are actually independent uh, things? Like no. they're not kind of causing at a different level of detail? Uh, not necessarily completely independent, you know. Uh, here we see the prostaglandins, uh, they actually disrupt platelet aggregation, but they also disrupt vasoconstriction. So they, they have a dual function, essentially. So basically, all of these show up in the result. Uh, now, uh, whether platelet aggregation and blood viscosity are 
they both affected, but uh, how they are affected, in, uh, uh, that may be a separate thing. That may be a separate issue. Uh, you yes. have to further do investigations on I'll, that. I'll talk. I, it may be interesting to do. But yes. yes. I'll talk later on about what I've called dimension context, where one might be able to reason across these substructures. We, we haven't done that, but that's the kind of thing that I've thought about. All right. So just to, to move forward. So the task is to automatically create these complex associations on multiple thematic dimensions based on context. And this is the basis for the context-driven subgraph model. Now, this is an important problem. To, to use context is it's very, very important because the main issue when, when trying to address this problem is the issue of combinatorial explosion. Uh, this is the graph for Alzheimer's and arginine. All of the literature on Alzheimer's, all in arginine, all of the triples, put it together in a graph. This is a complex labyrinth, it's unintelligible, one can't make sense of this. The subgraph model essentially would like to take this graph of predications or triples. Uh, from that, given two concepts, extract out a, a more meaningful set, a more promising set from which discoveries are likely to arise. And uh, between that, that would be paths between Raynaud and Fish oil if those are my source and target. And then from that candidate graph, use context to partition the graph and ultimately arrive at these subgraphs on these different thematic dimensions, ideally where no two contexts are the same. The question, of course, is, well, how do we define context so that we can be able to do this? And that's what we'll talk about uh, for the remainder of the talk. To specify context, we derive foundations from both linguistics and semantics. In particular, we believe that we can represent the problem of automatic subgraph creation as one of capturing the relatedness between paths. Uh, is, is everyone there? Is there any issue? Can everyone hear me just fine? Or? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So we believe that we can represent this problem as one of computing the relatedness between paths. That would require that we specify the notion of the context of a path. Now, since we know that a path consists of a sequence of semantic predications or a sequence of triples, then the problem can be decomposed into how do we capture the context of an individual triple. Uh, to do this, we make several observations about the characteristics of Medline articles, uh, which is our main corpus. One of the things that we observe is uh, we know that Medline articles contain provenance metadata, the title, uh, the date of publication, the authors, uh, affiliation, and so forth. We know that they also consist of semantic attributes, uh, and these are, I'm referring here specifically to the mesh descriptors and the medical subject headings. These are terms that are assigned to Medline articles first by the medical term indexer and then refined by humans who read the entire content of the text and refine this list uh, in agreement that indeed the article is talking about some particular uh, topic. Uh, then there are supplementary concept records. I'm not sure the exact mechanism by which uh, those are, are assigned, but they do also capture some semantics of the article. Then there's a second level of characteristics that we observe. Uh, then these have to do with levels of abstraction. The textual content of the abstract, in essence, it captures a, a summary, a semantic summary of the meaning of the entire article. And this is true for, for abstracts in general. This specific article is talking about icosapentaenoic acid, or EPA, which is the ingredient in fish oil, potentiating or stimulating the production of prostacycline-like material, which is epiprostanol. Uh, this happens when EPA is used together with archidonic acid as opposed to archidonic acid being used uh, in isolation. Well, there's a sentence in the abstract that conveys exactly this. The author says, finally, the perfusion with HBA, which is human albumin, it's a serum essentially, containing 10 mol of archidonic acid plus 10 mol of EPA resulted in a significantly greater production of this prostacycline-like material uh, than when uh, the HBA was used alone. And so the fundamental point that's really being conveyed here is that EPA, it stimulates or it potentiates the production of prostacycline. Now, that's captured in the abstract. If we look at the mesh terms that are assigned to the article, well, we see there's archidonic acid, there, there's icosapentaenoic acid, there's epiprostanol, which is prostacycline, there's humans, there's umbilical veins. These mesh descriptors, at a higher level of abstraction, albeit, they do speak to the meaning of the content. Uh, and then we see the semantic predications or the triples that have been extracted from the content. Here, the first triple in particular says that icosapentaenoic acid stimulates epiprostanol, which is prostacycline. Well, this is exactly what the article is talking about. So if these things are true, then what we can do is we can represent first the document in terms of, of well, of course, the abstract that, that's normally done. Uh, 
but we can also represent the abstract in terms of this concept level semantic uh, summary, which is the mesh descriptors. We may also then be able to represent it in terms of the semantic predications. Since the semantic predications and the mesh terms essentially we're considering them to be equivalent, albeit uh, not equal, then one might be able to represent the context of a semantic predication in terms of the mesh descriptors that have been assigned to the article. This is the basis for our first assumption, which is to say, it's the interchangeability assumption, that the concept level and the relational semantic summary of a Medline article are in fact interchangeable. Specifically, what we like to say here is that a semantic predication can be represented in terms of the mesh descriptors. Now, your intuition is correct. When we go back to the article, what we're seeing here is that not all of these mesh descriptors are relevant to all of these semantic predications. Uh, let's see, veins produce epiprosinol. Well, uh, humans in particular, that doesn't really speak to that. Eh? Uh, humans contain veins, yeah, but not quite. So what we do is we make a second assumption. We say that for each of these semantic predications, if we take the distribution of all of the mesh descriptors that occur in Medline for, for the particular predication, then that might be able to give us an overall context. This is in fact our second assumption, it is the context distribution assumption, which says that the context of a semantic predication can be expressed as the distribution of all mesh descriptors associated with all articles that contain that particular semantic predication. And these two assumptions are the basis of our representation of context, which then enable us to represent the context of a path, and then to compute the relatedness between paths so that we can then cluster these paths into subgraphs along multiple dimensions. This sort of thing, it is deeply rooted in distributional semantics, which is a field pioneer by John Rupert Firth. Uh, Firth is famous uh, for being, being one of the first people to talk about the context-sensitive nature of meaning. Essentially, he says, in order to understand the word, one must understand its context. The word bad, for example, can, can mean exactly that, or it can mean good, depending on the context. So what he says is, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. This is a fundamental idea that's used in, in information retrieval and vector space model and so forth for finding words that are similar. Essentially, the idea is that linguistic items with similar distributions are, in fact, similar. We are extending Ford's idea here to say that semantic predications or triples that have shared context in their distributions are in fact related because we're interested in capturing related associations in these subgraphs, related albeit within some context, not similar. If we created a similarity subgraph, then if someone knows one of the, the concepts in there, then they probably know all of the others. Right, so now we go into some details on how exactly it is we do this. Well, we let's assume for the running example I have uh, that was manually created in the JBI article. Uh, if we wanted to cluster together or determine whether or not these two paths should be clustered, what we would do is we know that each of these two paths, they consist of a set of triples or semantic predications. We know that each of these semantic predications occur in some set of documents. We know that each of these documents have mesh descriptors. And we know that if we, in fact, we can aggregate uh, the mesh descriptors across the semantic predications, uh, to abstract the representation of the path in terms of, well, a vector of mesh descriptors. And if we did this for both of these paths, then essentially the issue of path relatedness it now becomes one of computing the relatedness between these two mesh vectors. Well, if we do this, this is a much more familiar representation of our problem. We can then apply the vector space model and all sorts of things uh, around this that we're aware of. The specifics of how to do this is what I'll talk about at, at the core of this dissertation research. Uh, I wanted to point out that this is the second contribution of this research. It is this representation of the context of the path as this vector of mesh descriptors. Suffice to say here that these mesh descriptors, in as much as they are assigned to Medline articles uh, as, uh, to index the content, they're also part of a hierarchy of background knowledge. And this, I believe, will be key in enabling us to actually capture both implicit and explicit context for the purpose of uh, subgraph creation. OK, so now we get into some details. Assuming here is an anecdotal example that the context of the path PI is as shown uh, in this example. Uh, MI, that's an abstraction for a mesh term, 
the numbers here represent the frequencies of these mesh descriptors uh, across uh, the fats. Well, so what we're seeing here is uh, essentially we have two sets um, of, of, of mesh descriptors with their frequencies for two paths. Uh, ideally, if we'd like to use a vector representation, cosine similarity strikes us as, as something that we might like to use. There is, of course, an issue here that cosine similarity allows us to compute similarity and not relatedness, which is what we'd like to compute. But if we did this, if we attempted to use cosine similarity, what we would need to do, of course, is represent the uh, and now my arrow here shows that I'm switching to the vector notation as opposed to the set notation. Uh, we need to represent these two sets on the same dimensions. And so all of the out of context things would be represented with zeros in the first vector. Uh, in the second vector, uh, all of the out of context ones would also be zero. And then we would compute the dot product and we would divide that by the length of the two, of the two vectors. Several important things strike us when we attempt to do this. First, what we see is that all of the out-of-context vectors in the first vector uh, that are not in the second, these would not contribute anything to the relatedness score. But this works fine for similarity. That's what cosine similarity does. Uh, second, the same thing happens for those in the second vector, but not in the first. The more critical issue, however, is that the lengths of the vectors, the, well, the lengths of the out-of-context vectors could, uh, unnecess well, uh, in, a, in a way that we would not, would not like, lower the overall relatedness score between the two paths. Uh, and that will happen here for all of these other context things. Essentially, it lowers the relatedness score between the, the two vectors. This, well, this is good for, for similarity. It is not what we would like for relatedness. The truth is that these two paths, they are as related as their shared context. The, vector, uh, the descriptors M1 and M2 are common to both of these paths. And so that is their shared context. And so we approach this task of computing the relatedness between pairs of paths by, by using this fundamental idea. First, what we would like to do, we have two objectives. One, we would like to maximize the weights of these in-context descriptors and then minimize the weights of these out-of-context descriptors. There are several ways one can do this. The first thing one can do is, well, let's take a second look at these frequencies. We can imagine that if we just, well, let's say we remove the denominator because those are the lengths and those are, those, those are the bad news. But if we still keep the frequencies, it means that uh, if we have a third vector that has uh, a third vector that has M1 and M2 with different frequencies, then the dot product of these frequencies will give the two pairs of paths uh, different relatedness scores. Well, this is also undesirable because, again, the paths are as related as their shared context. So the first thing that we do is we binarize the vectors, that is to say, we eliminate the frequencies. And we simply consider a mesh descriptor as either present or not present. Uh, this then, in my simplistic example, will reduce my relatedness score to be the dot product of the binarized vectors, which is in fact equal to the intersection of the two sets, which is just simply two. Now, of course, our intuition is correct. The problem is not this simple. And just to make that clear, uh, let's take a look at some of the mesh descriptors I've assigned here just anecdotally to make the point. Let's look at the first, uh, first mesh descriptor. That's platelet aggregation, which seems to be present in both sets. Epiposinol also present in both sets. However, let's assume, well, let's take a look uh, here. We see that platelet activation is present in the second vector, but it's not present in the first. Now, what we know from the mesh hierarchy is that platelet aggregation and platelet activation, uh, one of them is the parent of the other. Uh, we know that as well for platelet adhesiveness. Um, the, the platelet adhesiveness and platelet aggregation, they're, they're siblings. So it seems to suggest, and the same thing for epiprostanol, it's a sibling with the, with the prostaglandin. It seems to suggest that these two paths are in fact more related than their exact matches suggest. One was taken into account not just these exact matches, but also the inexact matches. And to do this, we obviously would like to rely on the structure, but at least that's the, the point I'm making here, that we rely on the structure of background knowledge to provide this additional uh, enhanced, semantic enhanced, shared context. Uh, now, in terms of specifics, how do we leverage this in a meaningful way? Well, what we would do is, well, it's essentially the cross product of the two sets. And now we probably back away from the vector notation because 
uh, the vector representation will really not help us all that much. And I'll talk about why I've, I've done that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, what we really would like to do is to take the cross product of these two sets, and for every pair of mesh descriptors that are above some threshold of mesh semantic similarity, then we would like to increase and increment our overall uh, semantic relatedness score. And, uh, well, we, we do that by using dice similarity as the metric for semantic, uh, semantic similarity. We're making no, no novelty contributions here. In fact, I had uh, Swapnil and Nishida who work with me on this implement the set-based approaches, that's, that's DICE and Jacquard. They implement the path-link-based approaches, that's uh, RADA, uh, Wu Palmer, Lee Kok Chodoro. They implemented the information content-based approaches, uh, that's Resnick and Jane Conrad, and there's one other. Uh, the actual threshold or metric that's used to select the threshold is not so significant as the observation that one needs to use this structured background knowledge to do that. Uh, I have a question. Sorry. Sure. So, so basically what you're saying is that you, you're not going to use uh, count of the same thing appearing, but if related concepts appear, then you want the contributions from them. Yes, we would like to capture the relatedness between exact matches and inexact matches. And to capture the relatedness between inexact matches, we will use structured background. And, and, and aggregation and adhesiveness, they mean different things? They're very related, very, very related. Plated adhesiveness, and platelet aggregation. I know they're not the same thing, but they're highly related. One plus the other. One um, so one thing that I think I mentioned this in a couple of our discussions in the past is that I think you 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 got you started down the right road here and then missed one opportunity in my mind, which is to say that assume that you have two related you have a mesh term and it's the only mesh term that's shared in the context. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a perfect relationship. The mesh term is in both. If that mesh term is at a very high level of the mesh hierarchy, you have less related documents to my mind, or less mm -hmm. related predications than if it's at a low level. So two documents that are about humans are not as related as two documents that are about cell cycle regulation in humans. Yes, absolutely. And this is using the measure of specificity uh, from the structured background knowledge right. uh, to be able to speak to the relatedness of context. It's something that we've discussed. Uh, I haven't leveraged it in a specific way here, but it's, it's something that we've discussed perhaps as an enhancement over this, uh, this score. Right. Uh, one, one certainly can, can do that sort of thing. Now, uh, on, the, on the other side of that, uh, you know, in, in the context of the problem, right, uh, someone may say, and we've seen this, someone may say in the literature uh, that, that several proteins, and then they mention selenoprotein, right, uh, affect some very specific thing, but uh, they don't mention like very specific things about the protein or the selenoprotein. And so what, what, what is advantageous for us at this point is being able to capture things at a different level of specificity, but being able to capture the mesh descriptors that, that, that actually talk about them as well. So, you know, yeah. two, two uh, sides of the same thing. Right, so uh, we... Yeah, right. Yes. yes. Wake up, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, it's already in the morning. Uh, so, brewing question is, am I considering uh, the number of concepts on one side of the tree uh, compared with the number of concepts on the other side of the tree when I essentially do this kind of computation? Uh, inherently, this is sort of what DICE does, but I suspect that you're getting to a deeper point here. What DICE similarity will do is it will take uh, all of the ancestors of a given mesh descriptor and it will compare, it will in fact, it gets the intersection. Of, of the set of ancestors uh, for one mesh descriptor and the set of ancestors for the other. But I suspect you're getting to a deeper point, but I, I think this is consistent with what Dr. Raymer said, that one might like to uh, go a little bit deeper. And this is one of the limitations of this work that I've pointed out in, in the limitation section. 
So we manually set the threshold, I think, 0.75 or 0.8 um, for dissimilarity. What happens is if the pair of mesh descriptors, so let's say platelet aggregation and platelet activation, they have a, a similarity score uh, above 0.75, then we simply normalize that score to 1. If the score is below, it, it, we make that 0. And this is consistent with my two objectives, which is to maximize the weights of the in-context descriptors and minimize the weights of the out-of-context descriptors. And doing this, then the overall uh, semantic relatedness score, it becomes essentially just the cross product of all of these pairs of, of mesh descriptors that are above the threshold. Uh, in this case, it would be five. Uh, the one here for the exact match with platelet aggregation. And then there's an additional one for platelet aggregation, another one for platelet adhesiveness, and, and so forth. Uh, this is the third contribution, and I think the most important contribution of this dissertation research. It is in fact the use of structured background knowledge for computing this shared context, or this semantic enhanced shared context uh, between paths. An unfortunate side effect of doing this is that paths that are highly related, those are paths that would essentially be similar with many mesh descriptors, they end up with a very high score compared with others that are not so similar that have lower scores. And so we, we apply a lot of reduction just to reduce the disparity uh, between these scores. Again, we're making no novelty claims here. It's just an, an aesthetic reduction of the scores. Uh, so that when we view the scores on a graph, uh, it, it's reasonable to deal with. Uh, to do that specifically, what we do is we take one term in the first vector, we compute the relatedness with all of the other mesh descriptors, and then when we get that score, we apply the log plus one, and then we, we sum across the two sets. Uh, so if we have this metric now for computing uh, the semantic relatedness between two paths, then our next task is to actually use it to perform the clustering. I have implemented, I've selected the hierarchical agglomerative clustering algorithm as my approach for doing this for two reasons. One, hack is, uh, is an unsupervised, unsupervised algorithm. I don't need to specify the number of clusters, and this is exactly what I would like to do. I would like for the data to naturally align based on its context, as I have defined. Uh, the second reason is this hack, it's uh, deterministic. Uh, there's no you know, random walks or randomization going on. So every time I run the algorithm, I essentially get the same output. Uh, to do this, just to make things a little bit more palatable, hack starts off by putting each of the paths in the candidate graph to be clustered into a separate bucket. I would take the first path uh, in the bucket population phase, and I compute the relatedness score between that path and each of the other paths uh, to be clustered. Whichever paths are above the threshold of, uh, now this is a threshold for path relatedness, right? I need to decide when to cluster two paths based on the overall uh, score derived from the mesh semantics hierarchy using background knowledge and the log reduction and so forth. I'll talk about that in just a bit. And then I move to the second path and I do the same thing. And after I have completed this bucket population phase, then the next task is essentially to merge the buckets. One can imagine that uh, this path, uh, after I compare or compute the relatedness with all the other paths, well, one bucket will be created with these two, for my example. When I get to this path, well, it's going to create a bucket with this and the first one. And so you need to merge minimally uh, buckets that are exactly the same. Of course, one may suspect that there may be some buckets that are sort of related, but they may or may not have the same paths in them. We would also like to be able to combine those. And the metric for doing that, it's called the interest cluster similarity that I'll talk about in just a bit. Uh, don't, don't worry about my slide numbers. Uh, there's 10 or 15 slides that I'll just skip over uh, because they're part of experimental results. So in the bucket merging phase, I do the same thing. I essentially take one bucket and I compute the relatedness score with the other bucket in terms of, it's really the average of all of the pairs of paths in the two buckets. That's the intercluster similarity, and then I, I merge them. Uh, an important step here is one needs to be able to enforce this threshold for path relatedness uh, that, that actually cascades for bucket relatedness. Otherwise, we may end up recovering the original candidate graph, which is not meaningful to us. And so the question that we will look at uh, Next is how do we specify this threshold for path relatedness? Once we've done this and we have a cutoff for our number of buckets, then we simply rank the buckets and we present those to the users. Uh, so just to do a summary here as a checkpoint, 
we are attempting to compute this threshold for path relatedness. We have represented our problem. Uh, we know that the path uh, is represented as a vector or a set really of mesh descriptors. We've used this business of semantic enhanced shared context that uses the mesh hierarchy, structured background knowledge. We've applied a log reduction. And we said, well, we will manually set the mesh semantic similarity. And hopefully, I, I, I'll get a pass for that. But we certainly don't want to manually set also this threshold for uh, path relatedness. That would not be a proper thing to do. So for the Raynaud fish oil experiment, again, that I continue to refer to as my running example, we had no idea how to compute this threshold automatically. And so we just set it manually. We tweaked, I tweaked around, and I eventually saw, well, at this threshold, the graphs that were being produced, uh, they were readable. At least I could look at them, and I could see some things. Uh, but to do this in a more principled way, what I did was, for each, and I think there were 200 paths to be clustered, the 200 paths that we manually put together, uh, I think in th 14 or 15 subgraphs reported in the JBI paper. Uh, what I did was, for each pair of paths, I computed their relatedness score, and I plotted it on a graph. And this is what we see from that graph. Uh, what we see here is, on the x-axis, I have the distribution of scores from 0 to 3.5. And now my log reduction comes in quite handy because this is just my range. I can easily guess 3 or 2.5 or 2.75 and you know, get things working very quickly. But what I'm seeing here is that around 1.75 or so of relatedness score, I have about 1,300 or so uh, pairs of paths. It's 20,000, uh, excuse me, 200 by 200 would be about 40,000 path pairs. So 1,300 or so of those uh, this seems to be like a mean value, it almost looks like, right? Uh, what we're seeing is that less than 1.5, let's say, uh, there's not that many path peers. Above 2.5, there's not that many path peers. But around this value of 1.75, it seems like there are many path peers to the left uh, or, and to the right on either side of, of the mean. And for those of us who know statistics, this is reminiscent of a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution. If we wanted to, uh, if we sample uh, the, the heights of all people across the world, we'd say take 10,000 people from each country. And uh, if we plotted that in a graph, what we would get is, well, most people are around about 5, 7, 5, 8. I think this has actually been done. Uh, there's few people less than 5 feet, let's say. And there's fewer, relatively speaking anyway, who are above 6, 5, 6, 7. But most people are sort of around this, this mean. Uh, and this is a classic of a Gaussian distribution. So I actually computed the mean and the, the standard deviation of uh, three, for three of the initial experiments. And I plotted the distributions. And this is what I got. Now, this is good to see because uh, the data here approximates to a Gaussian, albeit that it's not exact. What we're seeing here, sorry. Um, one thing I, I, I would suggest actually here is it wouldn't take much effort to add in uh, if you actually did a Kolmogorov Smirnov test or an uh, Anderson Darling test for normality and see if it is Gaussian. Yeah. I, I did chi squared. You did chi squared variance. It, not, not very good. Okay. Not a very good Gaussian. Okay. Uh, but again, this is one of the limitations that I talk about. Uh, and, and this is exactly what I'm getting into. What we're seeing here is that, well, it looks Gaussian, but not, not quite, right? What's happening is uh, from zero, relatedness scores from 0 up to about 1.5, 1 1.7. Like, there's sparse data. These points need to be really close together. This actually makes sense in terms of the semantics of the problem. Each of the path pairs will start with Raynaud and start with fish oil. That means that each of the path pairs, well, each path, will have some triple that starts with Raynaud, some intermediate, perhaps some other thing, and then end with, with fish oil. Well, if you go back to where those triples have come from, which is from the Medline articles, then those Medline articles would have minimally been tagged with Raynaud or and or fish oil. And so there is some minimum relatedness score among all of the paths. It's certainly not going to be zero. I mean, if you took two paths that were just completely disparate, uh, disjoint, then you would get some zero score, maybe. Uh, but if all of your paths are on Raynaud and fish oil, you'll get some minimum score. One good idea that Varun suggested that I do here is I recompute the relatedness between the paths uh, relative to the minimum or relative to the maximum score, essentially defining the relatedness not just in terms of the actual relatedness, but also in terms of unrelatedness. And, and this, is, this is essentially what this will do, is sort of shift this graph 
to the left and make the points more compact and give us a, a better Gaussian. But in terms of have I done this in a systematic way, uh, the answer is, is no. I have assumed that this is a Gaussian that, that could be good for our purposes and move forward uh, in, in that way. Uh, so assuming a Gaussian, we know several properties about Gaussian functions. One, Gaussian distributions have what's called uh, these two points of inflection. At the points of inflection, one can think of them as demarcating some uh, particular event or, 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 or uh, characteristic of the data. One could think of these as what it means to be short on the one side and tall on the other side in terms of my example with the heights of people in the world. An interesting observation for me was that when I compared the manual values that were set across the three scenarios, and again, I had no idea about uh, this detail of Gaussian distribution when I did this, I just set it uh, to get good graphs. Well, these values were consistently between the second standard deviation from the mean on the one side and the third standard deviation from the mean on the other. Well, this gave me an idea that perhaps I could use the second standard deviation from, from the mean as my standard threshold, and this is what I did. So given this metric now to compute path relatedness, Right? So now we can cluster things together that are above this threshold, which is essentially the second standard deviation from the mean. Then we can now do our bucket merging based on standard uh, metrics for bucket uh, similarity. This is from the Christopher Manning textbook at Stanford from the introduction to information retrieval course that Dr. Prasad uh, has taught. And uh, after we merge the buckets, then we simply rank them, and then we'll wrap up the presentation. Now, for bucket merging, uh, single link similarity is not ideal. Single link similarity will essentially, for each, it will compute the maximum similarity score, and my dots here represent paths, the maximum similarity score across all pairs of paths in the two buckets. And if that maximum score is above my threshold, the second standard deviation for me, then I merge the buckets. This is not good because it may mean that the other paths that are not the maximum, those may be fairly lower, much lower than the actual maximum what will end up happening is I'll end up with these straggly clusters. Yeah? For complete link, which is the opposite, it will use the minimum similarity. If the minimum similarity uh, uh, score across all pairs of paths in, in two buckets, if that is above my threshold, then it must mean that all of the other paths are also above my threshold. Well, that will give me very compact clusters, which is not bad, but it's not ideally what I want. What I want are things that are related within this context, but not so related. I want things that are in the region. I want to find uh, dietary fish oil with platelet aggregation, and I'd like to find not necessarily platelet adhesiveness. That's too close. That doesn't tell me much. I'd like to find prostaglandins, which are of type uh, uh, icosanoid, uh, and platelet aggregation is of type cell function. How it is that these two things are actually interacting uh, with each other is very, very important. So if I use the group average, this will bias too much. It will take the intracluster similarity uh, plus the intercluster similarity across the two sets. This will probably give me things that are too broad. What I've chosen is the centroid or the intercluster similarity, which essentially, for each pair of paths across the two buckets, it computes the relatedness scores, and then simply divides by, it's sort of like the average of the two sets. The final task, then, is to rank the clusters. To do this, I rank them by compactness, which is the intra-cluster intra rank. The intra-cluster rank simply takes a path, it computes the relatedness score with all of the other paths in that bucket and across all path pairs, then it divides by n times n minus 1, and I get my score. An interesting thing that happens here is that when I take, let's say, 200 paths and I run this algorithm, uh, I'll get some number of subgraphs containing more than one path. But I will end up with a number of singleton paths that did not cluster into any buckets because they didn't meet my threshold for path relatedness as I have defined. And so the question is, well, what do we do with these? Do we discard them or do we find some meaningful way of ranking them and looking at them? Uh, to deal with these, I use the measure of association of rarity to, to rank them. Essentially what rarity does is, uh, here is a path PI. I take each of the distinct concepts in the path as a representation of the association, abstraction of that. So that's A of PI is an association, which is really just the set of concepts in a path. I fire a query to Medline, and I ask, how many documents contain all three of these things? And if I get back a value of zero, 
Well, it means that these three things have never been talked about in the same Medline article. Well, <laughs> these are things that we would like to look at because they may be candidates for making discoveries. The intermediates are not known. And so uh, in this case, for, for singletons, because uh, the size of the set here is one, then this is really just the frequency of that association in Medline. But I use the same idea to, to estimate and compute the overall rarity of a, an entire bucket itself, an entire subgraph that I'll talk about in just a bit. So just to summarize and rewinding down, I'll show the demo in just a bit. Uh, we have computed the relatedness between pairs of paths as a way of clustering uh, uh, subgraphs or clustering paths into subgraphs, hopefully along multiple dimensions. We know that the path is represented as a vector of mesh descriptors. We have said that we've used this semantic enhanced shared context using this log reduction. Uh, we've manually set the threshold for mesh semantic similarity. Uh, the threshold for path relatedness is the standard deviation from the mean. Uh, for bucket relatedness, we, have, we know that there's a set of paths in a bucket. We've used the intercluster similarity for singletons uh, rather, we've used the second standard deviation, the same thing here, to cluster the buckets, uh, to merge the buckets, and then to rank the buckets, ultimately use the intra-cluster similarity and this measure of association rarity. So I won't talk about the algorithm. You, you, you might have correctly guessed that there's a pre-computing step here where we compute the threshold of relatedness first before we actually begin the clustering, uh, and we use that value to determine which paths will go into which buckets. The algorithm stops when the number of clusters in one iteration and the subsequent iteration does not change. I found that about four or five or so iterations, things settle down fairly quickly. Okay, so what have we done with this? Well, let's go back to our example where we manually created this subgraph reported in our JBI article. Uh, again, this is a complex association that has platelet aggregation with all of these prostaglandins, where the prostaglandins disrupt platelet aggregation as the mechanism for uh, presenting or treating Raynaud syndrome. Well, at the third standard deviation from the mean, like I said, I used both uh, just for testing. This was the first experiment that I ran. I generated just one subgraph, and this is that subgraph. I generated four subgraphs for the second standard deviation. Well, here's that subgraph you may not be able to see. What we're seeing is the fish oils, uh, the concept fish oils, and icosapentaenoic acid, which are tantamount essentially to the same thing. And I'm seeing Raynaud phenomenon in Raynaud disease, paths that begin and end with those. Now, this is not surprising. This is what the, we would have specified as input to the system. What we are, however, seeing is that in this subgraph, there's also a plate of aggregation with the disrupts relationship, as we had manually put together. And we're seeing that uh, the set of prostaglandins that were here, uh, well, we have the triple that says epiprostanol is a prostaglandin. We have one here that says alprostadil, not epiprostanol, disrupts plated aggregation. Well, alprostadil is PGE1, uh, epiprostanol is PGI2, I believe. These are all in the prostaglandin family. Now, your observation is correct. Well, you know, there are, there are links here that are missing. And indeed, there, is, there are, right? And now this goes back to a fundamental point that I made in the beginning of the talk, where I said that the purpose of the computational system is not to actually make the discovery. Rather, it is to find these promising links and present it to the scientists. In 1986, when Swanson explored this research question, there were four articles uh, in Medline on radon and fish oil. There were no articles on any of these things. If you had given a subgraph like this to him at that point that suggested that, well, <laughs> it seems the platelet aggregation are being disrupted and epiprostanol, it seems like those are disrupting the plate of aggregation, and that might be treating it, that could save, in my estimation, the domain scientists quite a bit of time in terms of, of their exploration. Now, to make this a little bit more palatable, and I'll skip over these slides, let me go. Let me just clarify. So in the previous slide, yes. the left part, the left off is manually done, and the yes. right part is This is automatically way. generated, yes. So given this, you could read the appropriate literature and try to fill in the details? And that's where we will go now to the web application. Uh, please, I'm going to switch away from the uh, full, uh, let's see here. I'm going to go to my demo. And what my demo, I'm going to actually switch gears here. I'm going to show for magnesium and migraine just to give an idea of the importance of having these things on different dimensions. So uh, here I'm showing a process for magnesium and migraine where Swanson found 11 connections between them. 
if you're generating a single subgraph <laughs> and you rediscover all 11, then you'll put them all into this one subgraph with all of these different contexts of the uh, domain scientists might not even look at, even if you did it. Right? My subgraph number one, what I'm showing here is that uh, in 1986, and my thing is cut off here, I've cut off all of my experiments to ex only the data that Swanson had at the time. There are only seven articles that mention both Raynaud and fish oil. There's one article here that at the time was published in 1973, some 15 years before Swanson did this, that actually suggested, it's an article in German, that, well, you know, magnesium glutamate, uh, which is a neurotransmitter, I think, might be used uh, to treat migraine. And the article sit for 15 years, and that was it. Swanson found, and I'll show my first subgraph here, subgraph number one that I generated among 25 subgraphs shows that, well, magnesium interacts with serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter, it's of, it's of that glutamate family. And it seems like serotonin causes migraine disorders. Well, for the main scientists, okay, so if serotonin is causing, if, if that's true, migraine, and magnesium is treating that, then perhaps magnesium is disrupting or inhibiting the serotonin levels. Now, the triple that's been extracted here says magnesium interacts with, and so that doesn't really tell us much. On the more interesting side, for whether or not magnesium causes that, in my tool, I click on the, the arc, and I get a set of articles. I think I get here four articles. The second article shows me in quite uh, some interesting detail. It says that much evidence has implicated serotonin in the pathogenesis of migraine or in causing migraine. Well, <laughs> let's look at that. The article starts off by saying serotonin which is released from aggregating platelets, and I stop, because I know that platelet aggregation is a second intermediate discovered by Swanson. So it says serotonin release can reach sufficiently high concentrations to affect local vascular functions in a number of ways. The monoamine can cause contraction of blood vessels, that's vasoconstriction. I stop again because I know that's a third intermediate that was found by Swanson. I read two sentences. Um, by providing both these complex associations with the provenance of the, of the triples in the scientific literature, we have effectively created the system to facilitate, provides these promising links that facilitates this process of making discoveries. I have found eight out of nine existing scientific discoveries by using this framework. As far as we are aware, that is the greatest number of, of rediscoveries that any one single system has made by automatically generating subgraphs and then allowing domain scientists uh, to look at, at the providence. Now, some may say, well, you know, uh, you could have done this using statistical frequency. You could have used pointwise mutual information. Uh, you have not shown that singular value decomposition will not work or LSA. Uh, and yes, indeed, point taken. Since we have not used any of the traditional frequency-based techniques, uh, graph-based techniques, uh, one might think that, well, whatever we're doing, it's just a hack job, right? But interestingly enough, the technique that we've used has produced concrete results. Whether or not something else can outperform us or do just as good, uh, there still is something to be said about the use of context from structured background knowledge. So, so why would something, to, so why would something uh, outperform? Uh, I mean, what would be the basis of it? So there's, well, there, are, there, is, there are several things going on here, right? I mean, one is, what are you considering as an input? You have, you have your data, basically scientific literature, and um, you have, uh, you know, your, your approach uh, takes as an input X, Y, Z. You have, of course, the text, you have the uh, provenance information, you have the mesh descriptors, you have the semantic verification. So you have a bunch of input that goes into your processing. Yes. And then um, there are some techniques. So you describe some techniques. You made um, um, a number of um, simplifying assumptions, but nevertheless, the technique uh, centers around capturing relatively rich representation of connections between the data uh, that you collected. Yes. And then you have, uh, you know, uh, and then that includes cutting off, accepting yes, and yes. so on and so forth. Uh, 
what, I mean, when you look at any alternatives, are they taking more inputs? Are they taking uh, richer representation? You have you shown richer representations gives you insight that uh, they don't give. Uh, is the simplified representation better? Why, why, why would it be a situation? Well, uh, sing I was trying to get my overflow sites to come up, unfortunately not. Uh, SVD, singular value decomposition, is one approach that, that could be used alternatively, I believe, uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, and that's because SVD will rely on the actual distribution uh, of the data in the corpus to be able to find things, substructures essentially, that are connected, albeit not explicitly. But, but uh, and it does this. Would, would SVD exploit uh, semantics behind mesh distribution? The answer is no. SVD, the uh, answer is no. Not, not in the way that we have done. I mean, how can you show that that is important and better? That, because if that, if that is what SVD cannot capture, and you can show that through an electrode, then maybe you have a case. Uh, I don't have a worked out example of that. Um, the, and so this is why my thesis statement here, uh, it says, that we, our claim essentially is that we are simply uh, creating a, an information processing system, right? That, I apologize for the, uh, the issues. Uh, essentially what we're saying here is that an information processing system that leverages these rich representations based on implicit and uh, explicit context, they provide an effective means for literature-based discovery. And that is what we have shown. Whether or not SVD or PMI may provide a more effective means, we have not addressed that no, question. But you have used SVD already, right? Right, but... So have they shown more? The answer is no. Uh, we are showing here uh, complex subgraphs on multiple thematic dimensions with the relationships in the graphs and also the provenance of the literature. Uh, we have simply not seen that kind of thing. Uh, Kartik's approach where he creates one subgraph using a greedy algorithm uh, claims to have found uh, Reynard Fish Oil, although that is, that is unpublished work. We have simply not seen someone uh, provide this much evidence for a technique by finding complex things on so many different dimensions. And just to, to make that point, and, and then I'll wrap up, uh, one might have, uh, from my, my demo, uh, I showed here with serotonin, uh, which is a, a monoamine neurotransmitter, my second subgraph, and I apologize if my display here is not, not that great, the screen resolution. The second subgraph contains magnesium and water and control groups and so forth, which is different in any case, although the subgraphs are not labeled, from what we see on serotonin. The third subgraph has clonidine, magnesium and clonidine. I'll skip forward. I think there's subgraph, uh, 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 I'll go to subgraph uh, 11, I think, that has glucose and insulin. Again, on a different dimension, subgraph 15 that has magnesium, glucose, uric acid. There's subgraph 22 I can't get to. Uh, these things are on, on different thematic dimensions. I'm not really seeing the same information across each of my subgraphs. And so using this particular approach, I'm able to find seven, I think, out of the 11 associations once and found. And I'm not really finding, well, for serotonin, I get to two or three other things from the, same, from the test. But in the subgraphs, they're on, on fairly different uh, dimensions. So just to wrap things up, uh, the time is running away from us. Um, okay, skip all the way. Okay, so just to wrap things up here, again, I apologize for switching between screens. Uh, we did a statistical evaluation to estimate the interestingness of the individual subgraphs. And uh, essentially what we did is for a given subgraph, uh, we go to Medline, we compute the rarity score of each of the associations, and we do this across all of the paths uh, in the particular experiments, and then we divide by the total number of paths, and we get an overall rarity score. Let's say, I'll just show you the results to show that. Uh, for Raynaud and Fisher, we know that in 1986 there were only four articles that mentioned both of them, Obviously, no articles that mention Raynaud, Fisher, plated aggregation. So we're not surprised by the number zero. This gives us an interesting new score of one. For testosterone and sleep, the discovery made by Tom Reinflesch and Chris Miller, there were 654 articles that contained the unique associations. That's an average of about 10 or so articles uh, per association. And so 
uh, these, these are not as interesting. Uh, I would go back to my demo, but we, are, we have found in an individual subgraph for testosterone in sleep, the, the exact information that Tom and Chris Miller uh, uh, showed. Um, this is quite interesting stuff, I believe. So just the one thing is done. So, so you kind of set aside one group called uh, association rarity or something of paths that were below the threshold, right? I mean, when you were trying the clustering, you had one bunch of paths that didn't quite cluster well because they were yes, below yes, the threshold yes. for all the cases, and so you kind yes. of separated them out. Uh, yes. So is that the place where things will work out nicely for interestingness score? I mean, is that it's, it's actually is that the target everything. for this? It's or? across everything. I simply take everything and I compute the, the inter interestingness score of all the subgraphs, of just all of the paths in the experiment. Just as an idea of if randomly, without looking at zero rarity things and so on, if we presented an export with a subgraph, would they even look at it? Would it be interesting in general? Uh, and it seems to suggest that perhaps they might. Uh, in my web demo, we are showing the integration of the predications graph with the corpus on the one side, and I haven't shown on the other side, if the graphs become too large, uh, you can actually click uh, the semantic types to filter them down. I'm actually running out of time. This is the fourth contribution here. It is not, it's not a deep integration, but it's, it's this idea of combining the assertional knowledge with definitional knowledge to facilitate literature-based discovery. Last thing, I've talked about context a lot. I've talked about context at the level of semantic indications as a vector of mesh descriptors. I've talked about context of a path by aggregating these mesh descriptors. I've talked about the context of the shared context of a subgraph, or shared context of two paths, by aggregating the mesh descriptors and then going to structured background knowledge to get inexact matches. And then I've talked about the context of a subgraph, although the context of the subgraph uh, is not captured through a label. And again, that is being obtained through mesh descriptors above this threshold. There's this idea of dimension context, where we have subgraphs that have these disparate themes. If one can reason, as Mendel, uh, as Sutton did, uh, for his experiments on cell division, uh, linking that to the experiments that Mendel had found on plants. If one could find a way of reasoning across these substructures, that would be a really nice thing to do. That's the kind of stuff that I stay up at night uh, and I get very excited about. We haven't addressed it here, but this is certainly uh, the kind of thing to look at uh, in the future of this kind of research. It's this idea of reasoning across these dimensions. I've made four contributions. One the context-driven subgraph model by, uh, and I've shown earlier that we, you could use this to rediscover and decompose Swanson's association. We've automatically uh, computed, uh, created subgraphs on multiple dimensions, and we found, I believe, two out of three of the associations with complex uh, uh, information there. We've specified this, this business of predication context in terms of this vector eventually downgrades to a set of mesh descriptors. We've used structured background knowledge to compute the shared context. And then we have, uh, in my web application, which I didn't show, we've used uh, both uh, the, the literature and the background knowledge to be able to filter things. Concretely, this work is distinct from all of the other things that I am aware of in one sense, if not in the other. We are the only uh, people to have done work where we are automatically creating these subgraphs seemingly on different themes. Uh, there's work uh, that, that automatically creates subgraphs uh, some of them have relationships in them. Some of them provide evidence from the scientific literature. But I am simply unaware of an approach that creates subgraphs on so many different dimensions that has, uh, in fact, uh, been able to recover uh, so much information. So we have some degree of confidence that if we were to apply this to all of MedLine and to all of the concepts in the UMLS and create a Google-style interface where there's a drop-down list when someone types something so you can search so essentially what this would be, it, it would be a, a different way of indexing the Medline corpus, not based on the documents that are there, but rather based on the atomic facts that have been extracted from the corpus. This, we believe, is something that could be quite significant. Again, we've used it to rediscover uh, eight things. <coughs> Several limitations. One, the manual threshold for mesh semantic similarity, not cool. Right? There's many things one can do there. The threshold for relatedness, it's, it's a bit, our, thing, our data approximates the Gaussian, but not quite. I mean, you could do uh, some better things there. Our definition of context uses just the mesh descriptors, 
I had a very intense discussion with someone who felt very strongly that relationships could be used as well. Uh, in, in the end, we selected the mesh descriptors because, well, they're manually assigned to the articles, and we believe that they, they should capture some kind of a concept level semantic summary that can be leveraged as we have done. But again, it, there can be an ensemble of, of approaches, uh, ensemble approach where several features are being used. Um, that's possible. Uh, we're not doing a deep integration here of the background knowledge of the scientific literature. Our focus here really is on the literature, not so much on the background knowledge. If someone's making discoveries from background knowledge, there are several issues. One, unless the main experts put the knowledge in the background knowledge source, well, you're not going to find it. If you did a search today on Medline for P53 and cancer, and you did a search in the UMLS for P53 and cancer, there's an obvious disparity between all the information that's there that domain experts just did not know and put into the UMLS. Now, you may be able to discover things from the UMLS, but that's, that's ontology-based discovery. We're not in the ontology-based discovery business. We're doing literature-based discovery. Suffice to say that I believe that it is the combination of these two things uh, that will be most effective. But our work is, again, the title of my dissertation is a context-driven subgraph model for literature-based discovery. Uh, Contradiction detection is something we haven't done. They are contradicting uh, predicates in the graphs. We simply allow the domain scientists to go to the literature and to sort those out, consistent with my, uh, my argument that it is the domain scientist that will make the discovery, not so much the system. Uh, a better statistical evaluation is perhaps in order uh, than the one that we have done. And I think the most important thing is the scalability of the clustering algorithm. It runs in about 45 minutes. We just got a new machine while I'm on my way out. Uh, but it would be interesting to run this on all of, of the UMLS and provide this new way of indexing the, the biomedical literature. It is an open secret that my long-term aspiration uh, is to get into entrepreneurship. Perhaps this is the kind of thing I might be, uh, may or may not be successful at, we don't know. Labeling subgraphs uh, could be very helpful, although we've seen that it's not absolutely necessary, but it certainly could be, could be helpful. So the future of information processing systems we believe could and will benefit from richer representations to be able to extract the knowledge and to mine and analyze the knowledge in both structured and unstructured text. We have seen this in personalization. Uh, we've seen the use of structured background knowledge to create hierarchical interest graphs. IBM has a project called Bluemix uh, that's doing human activity modeling. Uh, we have seen this in mobile applications, we've seen this in our prescription drug abuse project where we are mapping uh, slang expressions to structured background knowledge and using that to facilitate search and text exploration. We believe that leveraging such rich representations will put together, will be able to leverage together implicit context with explicit context and ultimately move towards these powerful semantics uh, for in fact uh, various applications. This dissertation simply applies this idea to literature-based discovery or to biomedical literature, but the fundamental idea remains that we believe uh, strong for a variety of applications, which we have seen. Uh, don't need to repeat, we have used all of this to rediscover eight out of nine things. I have published a number of things. Most of my research is on text mining and literature-based discovery. I've done quite some work on the Predos project, and I thank Dr. Carlson uh, for his attendance and for uh, working together. I think the Predos project has been one that, uh, that we've, we've been very pleased with. Um, I leave you with this, uh, this quote from H.P. Lovecraft, who is a science fiction writer. Uh, Lovecraft says that someday the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee into the deadly light and into the peace and safety of a new dark age. We are all progressive folks, and this is one of the times when we would like to move towards the light as opposed to fleeing into darkness. Uh, I thank you for your time. I thank a number of people who have assisted uh, throughout my PhD. Uh, of course, my committee, uh, Dr. Sheth, for his leadership and his guidance. I'm particularly grateful to Dr. Sheth for always challenging me to address uh, real-world problems with real data, uh, to, to come up with real solutions that have a real impact uh, on, on society. Uh, Dr. Raymer for many uh, insightful discussions, some of which he raised today, which we still have not done, but I think which enhance and put into focus uh, various aspects of this work.
uh, Dr. Prasad, for many discussions we've had, not just on this research, but on, on several others, and for always getting down to, to conceptually what's happening and forcing me to put things into perspective. Uh, I thank uh, also uh, Dr. Reinflesch. Uh, I did two internships at NIH, and my discussions with Dr. Reinflesch were always intellectually charged, very stimulating. Dr. Reinflesch has made two discoveries from scientific literature, and he continues to be a pioneer in the field of LBD. I thank also Dr. Kabluru at the University of Kentucky, uh, who is someone who is uh, very uh, focused on details, um, and I really appreciate those discussions, my notations, my formalism. Uh, I owe whatever uh, I've learned there to him. I thank Varun uh, Bhagwan, who was my mentor when I interned at IBM. I think I've learned from Varun uh, this idea of dialogue with data. When solving a research problem, while it's important to know a bunch of techniques that may be able to solve your problem, ultimately one must take a look at the data. Uh, the data will actually tell you whether or not the technique that you're thinking of is appropriate, and one might be able to derive a more uh, appropriate solution. And so I thank these folks and all of my Nuisis friends and colleagues, those who are present, but those who are uh, also joining us remotely, for quite a, a wonderful experience. I've learned a lot professionally, certainly being here at Nuisis. Uh, I think I've learned more personally than I have uh, professionally. So uh, thank, thank everyone, and uh, thank you for, for your time. Questions uh, for people not on the committee, and then go to the questions for people on the committee. So, yeah, okay. I have a question on. So we did just the on literature base. What if we have the web pages and the web pages for those tags? So we have a lot of these tags. Yes. The the question Hemant is asking is, well, is your work applicable to just uh, scientific literature? And uh, this is a question that's come up before. Uh, in principle, in fact, I've had an interest in applying this to legal documents. Mm -hmm. um, in principle, everything holds. What you really just need is a way to index uh, the legal documents, uh, and keywords may already exist. Uh, after you index the documents, you would need some kind of a legal ontology, and I've actually seen some of these in circulation. But in principle, we can really apply this, and this is why I made the point that I believe future information systems will need to leverage uh, with structured background knowledge to be able to interpret uh, and analyze data in a variety of applications. So yes. So yes. the interestingness score or something like that, right? You had something like that. So do you think there will be everything in the corpus that's probably not even related in the interestingness? How do you deal with such a scenario? Because there may be literature based do like documents which may not mention two concepts because it doesn't make sense. Well, right, and so our approach here is doing exactly that, right? It's taking uh, statements from one document, let's say. It's taking another statement from another document, and it's essentially connecting those statements based on the, the, uh, the shared concept and, of course, the underlying uh, mesh descriptors that are used for those documents. Okay. So, while an individual document may, and we've seen this for testosterone and sleep, and perhaps I can show this now. Uh, for testosterone and sleep, uh, Tom and, and Chris Miller, they had, uh, you know, the key piece of the puzzle was really what was happening in terms of testosterone and cortisol from the cortisol literature, and here's subgraph number seven, uh, that shows, and this shows the exact relationship here correctly. But what they knew was that, well, you know, cortisol disrupts sleep. That's, that was sort of well known. And, and this is why we have this uh, rarity score. It's 10, uh, interesting score. It's very, very high, or very, very low. The rarity score very high. The critical piece was uh, what's going on with testosterone and cortisol. And in my application, it turns out that it is this first article by Rubinow that is actually cited in, in the, the sleep paper as the article that gave the key information. So this is why I actually did not implement PMI or uh, SVD or these kinds of things. Uh, fundamentally, I, I, I do not really believe that, uh, that it is frequency of distribution that speaks to, to, to discoveries or speaks to new knowledge. It is context. That, that speaks to discoveries. On the one side, you know, cortisol and sleep was well talked about. On the other side, cortisol and testosterone was not really all that well talked about. Uh, what brought them together here is their context. Testosterone inhibits cortisol, 
and cortisol disrupts sleep. So you say SVD, you're talking about comparing documents, right? Well, you could represent the path uh, in terms of the, the mesh descriptors, right? As a, as a representation for like a term uh, document kind of, or document term matrix. So you could take a path, uh, and my background slide is not coming oh. up. But you could do that. Yeah. OK, uh, I think we'll uh, wrap up here and then take questions from just the committee. So I thank, thank you once again.